I'm Andy Sherman. I'm the president of the Friends of Harold Parker. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what the friends are. And uh, we have friends here, so happy uh, that we have a good showing. And uh, we'll basically, I'm going to cover Harold Parker history. Um, that's that's really the, the main focus today. But uh, we do have a number of people here, both friends, uh, people who work with the DCR. And uh, so we've got some talent here, too. Uh, there are going to be a lot of things I don't know. Um, but when it comes to history, you know, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. So uh, we'll, we'll see if we can uh, make it fun. And, Is it and, okay if I put that yeah, up for now? Yeah, sure, whatever works for you. Okay. So um, I'm just going to go right through a timeline, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about Harold Parker, and then we have hopefully some time if you have questions and also... Uh, as I say, we have a number of people here who could talk more about things I don't know a lot about, including uh, some of the nature, flora, fauna, and that, that kind of thing. So, all we got to do is go. So, Harold Parker, uh, it's about a 3,000 acre state forest. It uh, is kind of unique in the Massachusetts state forest, and it, it spans four different towns. So. North Reading being one, and Middleton, Andover, North Andover. Uh, and so this is a map of it. Um, and we're even missing some parts. There, there are sections of Harold Parker that aren't uh, contiguous with the main part of it. Uh, and I'll mention a, a few facts about that. Um, and as this says, it's even though it's only uh, 20 miles north of Boston, it certainly doesn't feel like it when you're in it. Um, so we'll start history or really geology. Um, it, this is uh, some of these facts I did not know. I've heard uh, a couple of talks about this now that uh, how Harold Parker the, and really the, where we sit right now in North Reading, uh, part of what we're standing on or sitting on is uh, Gondwana, so it broke off of Africa and we're talking millions and millions of years ago. Um, and you can see that there, some of that uh, formation was volcanic that, that uh, made it all the way uh, from what's now Africa to, uh, to here. Um, and there are just numerous uh, geological things going on with Harold Parker with these, these kind of terrains. Um, what really, I think, distinguishes uh, this area and Harold Parker very specifically is the impact of the ice sheet that was in uh, the Laurentide ice sheet, uh, two miles thick. Hard to imagine that uh, there was two miles of ice on top of us, so to speak. But that has had a huge impact on this whole north uh, shore area. And very specifically on, on Harold Parker. So, uh, yeah, 50 to 20,000 years ago uh, is when the ice, 20,000 is when the ice receded. And so there are all sorts of traces of that ice age uh, or that ice sheet, including one of the most uh, notable features in Harold Parker, which is this uh, you know, glacial erratic. And uh, it has anybody seen that? Yeah, everybody? Okay. So that that's kind of the, the go-to. It's actually uh, right off of Jenkins Road, so it's one of the things in Harold Parker you can get to without uh, uh, doing too much walking and without getting lost. And getting <laughs> lost is what most people do when they go into Harold Parker, at least the first time. And, and the friends are trying to help fix that problem. Also, uh, kettle ponds, which are uh, natural ponds, spring-fed ponds that were left as the glaciers receded. There are two kettle ponds in Harold Parker. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give some of my, my future story away, but there are a total of 11 uh, ponds in Harold Parker. Only two, though, are actually natural, so nine of the 11 are man-made. We'll talk a little bit about that. 
There are also some drumlins, uh, which are, are hills that were created basically as the ice receded. Um, and the largest drumlin in, in Harold Parker is uh, one of those sections that's not the contiguous main part of the park. It's across 114 uh, in North Andover. But uh, you, you do see drumlin activity, it, multiple drumlins in Harold Parker and really throughout the area if you're familiar with uh, places like Ward Reservation, uh, that's another. Uh, there, there are multiple drumlets, and all the hills are drumlets there. So uh, we're jumping from millions of years ago, or, or, uh, or tens of thousands, rather, to uh, really any kind of uh, human presence. So there's evidence uh, of uh, Native Americans, hunter-gatherers, uh, going way back. Um, and as you can see, there have been some sites uh, found in Harold Parker. Most of those uh, were found along the Skug River. And the Skug is going to be a recurring theme as we talk about Harold Parker. Uh, there's so much of the uh, past activity and, and a lot of current stuff that all is uh, happening around the Skug. So we'll talk about that a lot. Uh, along the Skug, there's been evidence of a couple of different kinds of sites. One was uh, uh, canoe building or dugout uh, building. So there were remnants found of that. Uh, there's another that was uh, basically utensils, if you will. Um, there's uh, a lot of soapstone in Harold Parker, and so there was evidence of soapstone being used for uh, implements, uh, and then some pottery. And also one uh, burial site was unearthed in what became Jenkins Farm, and again we'll talk a little bit about that. So these uh, Native Americans were uh, the Agawams, basically a part of the Oak Greater uh, Algonquin tribe. And uh, I, I, I would not claim by any stretch that this is a accurate representation, but uh, that's kind of the, the picture. Part of the reason for that, we don't know a lot about the uh, Indians or Native Americans. Um, by the time the English settlers started to move in uh, into this area, the Indians had already experienced uh, a lot of pandemic and disease, and uh, so the population was, was uh, fairly uh, non-existent in, in the Harold Parker area. Um, there, you know, there were some uh, conflicts, as you can see, but uh, th this local tribe really wasn't part of that. Uh, and uh, the, uh, as I said, in terms of Harold Parker itself, by the time the um, English, primarily English settlers started moving in, in the 1600s. Uh, there really was no, no real active uh, Native American population. So one of the first families to populate Harold Parker is the Osgood family, or was the Osgood family. Uh, and as you can see, they were granted uh, 400 acres, uh, John Osgood, uh, 400 acres in 1662. Uh, this, I'm pretty sure, and um, as my wife and I like to say, because we learned this from my son's trumpet te teacher, if you're wrong, be strong. So I'm going to be I be very strong. This is a John Osgood uh, foundation. Um, I, I am pretty sure it is. There are uh, there were three. No, oh, you don't. Okay. Well, I was wrong, and I'm strong, but you're right. So what? What? Who? Who is it? Well, the Osgoods owned it, but they never really, really lived there. Okay. Yeah, they lived in Salem, and they had daughters, and the daughters all settled. Woodbridge and a few right. others. Right. Muscatoss Farm up yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the one they tore down. Yeah. That, that road, that it was original road coming south of Reading, it's been, there was an old house there, and yeah. now there's a McMansion in there or something. Yeah. But, well, no, there were, I don't know if this is the Osgood farm, but there were. Well, that's the Osgood farm. They had actually. 
probably about 600 acres too. Yeah, they they, yeah. they did. They got up to yeah 500. They had three houses. Yeah, on they the were property. adjacent to my family. I know. So. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. You mentioned the ward. That's Holt Hill. That's my family. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the Russells and the uh, Abbots. Yep. Okay. Well, they all got uh, the, all of those families were tied up in yeah. this. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Mary Osgood was one of about 30 people in Andover who got uh, wrapped up in the uh, witchcraft days. Um, and this was uh, 1692 or thereabouts. Um, I've got to read this because it's pretty incredible. So this was part really totally... Uh, simultaneous with the Salem witchcraft. Um, so there were multiple reports of witchcraft activity. Um, and as I said, 30 people or so got uh, swept up in this. Um, Mary Osgood, or as they called her, Goody Osgood, good, good wife Osgood, was the wife of, of John. Um, so she confessed that for 11 years, she had been devoted to the service of Satan. She had prayed to the devil instead of to God. She had been baptized by the devil in Five Mile Pond. She had taken many midnight journeys through the air in company with Deacon Fry's wife and Ebenezer's wife and Goody Tyler. She expect, had expected to have great satisfaction in the devil's service, but he had never given it to her, and she was miserable. So she got herself in a, a lot of trouble. Uh, and as it turned out, she was basically bullied or pressured or coerced into that confession, as were many of those uh, uh, women, and also men. It was uh, both, primarily women. And uh, her husband was uh, one of the people who coerced her into that confession. Uh, the belief was that if she confessed, or all of them confessed, they'd get forgiven and get out of trouble. <laughs> and it didn't go that way. Uh, so they basically, they were in jail uh, or you know detained. Um, and she uh, ultimately was, was released. Uh, what happened was the town, including her husband, banded together. They, uh, found they, there were two kind of competing ministers in town. One was uh, pushing the the uh, witch trials, and the other was not in favor at all. And they ultimately were able to uh, give a lot of uh, testimony about her good character, and uh, and she was let go, as were a number of the other ones. Um, and about ten years after that, there was another. Uh, tr uh, trial or, of sorts to exonerate those who had been held captive. But three people were killed, uh, were uh, executed, two, two women and a man. So just kind of a crazy story. Um, and as it says, 1745, uh, the Peter Osgood sold part of his property to the Jenkins. Um, this may be difficult to see. This is a map from 1852, so this is quite a ways, uh, uh, ways after this. This is a beautiful map, by the way, that's in the uh, Andover Historical Society. <coughs> right here, that says Mrs. Jenkins, uh, William W. Jenkins, W. Jenkins, Sawmill, W. Jenkins. Um, so this is part of the what became the Jenkins Farm. And uh, there, there's a lot of Jenkins stuff that I, I'll talk about. It came from Reading, too. Oh, is that right? North Reading. It's Wilmington now. Yeah. yeah. So this was the, um, it's called today the William Jenkins House. It was actually built by his father, Samuel Jenkins. Uh, this, as you can see, 1758. So um, Samuel built it, and then uh, William lived there. He uh, had a pretty long life, and he had a pretty significant impact. Uh, back to that uh, map, there, William was mentioned a couple times. One was the house, which we just saw. 
and they also owned a uh, sawmill. This is maybe hard to see, but this is uh, behind, in the attic behind the, uh, the chimney in the William Jenkins house, and this was used uh, as a major stop on the Underground Railroad. So William Jenkins was a uh, very uh, fervent abolitionist, and uh, starting in 1830, he started uh, both uh, hiding uh, escaped slaves and also putting to work on the sawmill, and then also the I, I mentioned earlier soapstone. The Jenkins owned a soapstone quarry, and that's a great. Uh, part of the, the walk. If you're doing, looking at the erratic, go to the soapstone quarry, and right next to that is a, a uh, one of the two sawmills that the Jenkins had. So uh, the Jenkins family owned, owned two mills. That's, uh, they had nine, or whatever it was, I, I think it said, I forgot to say how many fireplaces was the amazing number of fireplaces. <laughs> Were they soaked on ones? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I think they had, uh, I'm going to say nine fireplaces, one of which was soapstone. Yeah, that's, that's uh, a soapstone fireplace. And this house is still there. This house, yeah, Four Corners, is Benjamin Jenkins. Um, and uh, he... Uh, well, actually, his father built this house, and then the Jenkins uh, and descendants lived there for about a different family for about 125 years. This house is still here, and I'm happy to say my wife and I own it and live there. Uh, this is not here anymore. This picture, by the way, was this is not 1803 or 1807. This is uh, right around 1906. You can see there are our, our uh, telephone, telephone. Uh, but it it's amazing to me they're they're still sorry. yeah no problem they're still using you know oxen and plow uh, to uh, till the till the farm the other thing and the Jenkins farm kind of like the Osgood farm became grew to five or six hundred acres as they acquired and a lot of the land went north. Uh, towards North Andover. This, this, this is Jenkins Road and Salem Street in Andover. Jenkins Road uh, is the extension of Haverhill Street, you know. Uh, and now, pretty obvious why it's called Jenkins Road with all this Jenkins stuff. Um, so it's, to me, it's kind of amazing they're plowing. Uh, it's also amazing they're farming. <laughs> because basically everything around our house is either ledge, granite, or swamp. <laughs> so, you know, how, how they farmed any of that, I, I just don't know. But that's also why they stopped farming. <laughs> because, uh, this is uh, sawmill number two. This is uh, visible as you drive on Harold Parker Road. And so this was also owned by the, uh, this was William Jenkins who owned this one. And this is a picture of the um, granite quarry. Um, those kids weren't there, obviously. But that was also uh, owned at one time by the, the various Jenkins. So, uh, so that whole set, most of what I'm talking about is in Andover. And so the, the Jenkins uh, had a big impact. And these are all kind of uh, highlights, I think, of uh, the walks you can do in, in Harold Park. Where is this quarry? This, um, this is on the east side of Jenkins Road, uh, on the Bay Circuit Trail, basically. If you cross, if you cross a bridge and you go up a hill, it's right there. Um, I, I've got some maps too. We can show you more detail. You remember there were no trees. Yeah. This is going on. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, I know this is almost unreadable. This is another piece of soapstone. This is William uh, Jenkins' uh, gravestone. And it says uh, he lived to see 
the fulfillment of his great desire, the end of slavery in America. This, there's a, a also, near, next to the um, William Jenkins house, which I showed you earlier, that is on a street called Douglas Street. It's a new road, a new street. Um, it's called Douglas Street because Frederick Douglass visited the, the Jenkins house, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. So, big abolitionist uh, gathering place. There's also a family um, uh, graveyard right next to it, cemetery. And it's, uh, they had to move some of the people, including William. He's now in Spring Grove Cemetery. So some of the originals moved to uh, uh, Spring Grove, but th th it's a great, that's a great walk too. Um, starting on Douglas Road, you can see the cemetery, you can see, um, you know, uh, the William Jenkins house, walk through the quarries and, and you're right near the erratic. So it's, it's, it's a great, great trip. Okay, now that's forward. Harold Parker. Um, so why is it called Harold Parker? He was the first commissioner of uh, the Park uh, State Forest Commission. This is Harold. <laughs> Harold, pretty cash for those days in his uh, t-shirt. Um, and uh, he was very instrumental in, in establishing this commission, which started the state forest. He died right as uh, Harold Parker was being built. Um, but uh, this commission uh, was instrumental in, in really doing some big work getting to uh, 70, ultimately, state forest. Um, so originally, 550 acres and some of it, the 10 families they bought property for, uh, including the Jenkins. So some of that Jenkins farm uh, turned into Harold Parker. This, this uh, basically wild and wastelands, and that's, I think, probably a pretty good description of what that, that property was at that time. Um, there's still, depending on how you view uh, swamp or wetlands, there is still a lot of wetlands in Harold Parker. So some people would call that wild or waste, uh, but it, uh, you know, it's, it's very beautiful. Um, if you don't mind mosquitoes. Ticks. Uh, yeah, a lot, yeah, a lot of ticks. So uh, originally 550 acres, and then over time it, it grew to what we talked about is now uh, 3,200 acres. Um, a really significant event for Harold Parker, or a series of uh, events really, was uh, triggered by the Great Depression and the CCC, which uh, Roosevelt was instrumental in creating. And uh, the CCC was to put uh, young men to work, but also to uh, uh, basically tackle projects that weren't getting done or wouldn't get done otherwise. And, and Harold Parker turned out to be a real beneficiary of that. So there were two camps, uh, two CCC camps at Harold Parker. Um, and uh, like it says, a lot of what you see today at Harold Parker was built by the CCC. Uh, so I mentioned earlier there are nine man-made uh, ponds in Harold Parker, and all the big ones, uh, uh, Field Pond, as you drive through Harold Parker Road, the biggest pond, it's, it's man-made. Uh, so the CCC uh, built the dams that created those, uh, those uh, ponds. And uh, the last couple of years, it, see, the Field Pond, for example, has been really low. And you see that it's a very shallow pond. There's stumps all over the place. It's, uh, I don't think it's over 10 feet in any, any spot there. A lot of it's three or four. Um, so <coughs> ponds, uh, uh, the dams that created that. And again, we have two uh, glacial uh, ponds. One is Berry Pond, I should have mentioned that earlier. So that's a, a kettle pond. Uh, the other is Bear Pond. And Bear Pond's uh, in the uh, northwest side 
kind of in the middle of that section. And they also did a lot of uh, planting. So uh, as you said, there was a kind of multiple eras of uh, deforestation that were taking place with all those, the Jenkins, and all their cohorts. Uh, they, uh, they milled and, and did a lot of uh, lumber uh, for building. Uh, there was a box company that used uh, Harold Parker wood. So there's virtually no first growth. Uh, we're talking second, third. I thought that, the, you know, they planted those red pines. You can see stands of them all over the place. I figured that's what they were from. But was the idea that those would just provide <coughs> cover for the forest to regenerate because it's not a native tree? And I was wondering why they would use it, you know, plant so much of a non-native tree when there's plenty of good. I don't think they thought about native. I don't know, Barbara, you may know more than I do. They planted the red pines because, as you can see, they grow really right. straight and exactly. tall in a very, very, very quickly. And the idea was to plant them and then sort of 17 years later to thin them so that they could, you know, increase in girth and, and be of more value. But by that time, the CCC was disbanded, and so we have these almost dog hair looking yeah. stands so of red. they intended to harvest them. I'm sorry? They intended to harvest them. Oh, yes, they intended for sure mm -hmm. to harvest them. So now our foresters um, have told me that they're kind of reaching their natural level of maturity. Mm -hmm. So we're going to lose a lot. Yeah, oh, there are, we are. are yeah. This, this is, it, it's beautiful. Yeah. But the trees are falling down like mm -hmm. right. they are falling down. crazy. They're not, they're not regenerating either. There's, there are no like, baby red pines in there. They're not <laughs> seeds. If they are, it's not doing very much, right? No, yeah, I, I mean, say. they mostly look like that. Right? I think they planted yeah. some over by Foster Pond, too, in Goldsmith. There's a couple of stands mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. Right? Yep. They're about the same age. Yep. Yeah, no, right. If you know what you're looking for, they're everywhere, especially in our state forests. Mm -hmm. These plantings, of, you know, solid plantings of red pine. Yeah, yeah. They just jumbo there. Yeah. But it was definitely part of a, a, a plan for logging and uh, commerce. So I skipped a couple things. Um, this is just one of the uh, dams. I think this is Collins Pond, and that's. Uh, teed up to be replaced, uh, and it needs to be. Um, the field pond dam was just replaced, I'm losing my years, two years ago, I guess? Yeah. So uh, this is also just this, the, the, it's a lot of words, but the CCC did a lot. <laughs> they were very active, and they, uh, they there's some beautiful uh, picnic areas that they created. Uh, so. Uh, roads, bridges, uh, so there, a ton of what's in Harold Parker is with CCC, which was great. That was almost 90 years ago or so, and so a lot of this stuff is uh, aged out, including the dams. So there, there is uh, a program to replace these, and Collins is next, as I say. Um, that, that, in my mind is a good thing. There will be, if you go along the road now, you'll see a lot of trees marked, so there's going to be a lot of uh, cutting. Uh, there's going to be quite a bit of uh, change to that, that terrain. That's what there was, um, uh, this is the, uh, there was a, a, a idea to create a reservoir for powering an old wood mill. Do you know if that actually happened? If there was a wood mill that was covered? Mm. I don't know. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I never heard of that. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that, this is Harold Parker Road, basically, wow. which isn't really a road. Wow. Like, Right down there. Uh, that's a sluice. So you can see Harold Park or Collins kind of fed right into Field Pond back then. Um, and I don't know when the the road went in, but uh, that that's one pretty significant change. Um, 
Oh, I also have this, the old fish hatchery. So this was CCC. There was an active uh, fish hatchery and, you know, uh, spawning or fish activity. So that was also part of this whole thing. This, as part of the Collins Pond, uh, is about to be torn down. So oh. if you like it, uh, <laughs> say, your, say your goodbyes. There was a dam and a mill behind that, too. Yeah. Russell Mill, that was. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This, I mean, it's not a pretty building, and I mean, there's, you know, kind of a nostalgic uh, uh, sense to it. It's, it's, it's at the dangerous state, so that's yeah, part of it. When I was a kid, it was pretty good. Now it's kaput. Yeah. You know, and the roof's gone and everything. Yeah. And people were climbing on the roof. Kids, and yeah. So that, that was becoming really dangerous. So that, that's about to go. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, this, back to the erratic. Um, and this is a, a Wednesday walk, I think. So uh, we have a lot of Wednesday walkers here. And uh, I, uh, some are friends, and, and Barbara was with DCR. Um, so uh, I, I threw this in because, uh, number one, the erratic, which is that uh, kind of landmark. And, and two, in terms of things that the uh, friends do, um, we, uh, we were formed about seven years ago, the Friends of Harold Parker, and uh, a big part of what we do is try to work with and support DCR. DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, is kind of, as it says, uh, supporting both conservation and recreation in state forests and other uh, state properties. And our friends group, when we formed, we had the same idea, which is conservation and recreation. We, we support both. What we try to do is work with DCR, um, and what uh, some projects we do cooperatively, um, things like walks and uh, events. Um, we also try to pitch in where DCR can't do things. Uh, and with the budget cuts that the DCR is getting, that, that is more and more. <laughs> our, our friends group has limited resources, so we can't do major projects, but uh, we, we raise money, we uh, do uh, construction projects, uh, we've done a few boardwalks and uh, things where we can improve trails or uh, work on things like that. We're talking to Barbara uh, and the, her interpretive group, which I want uh, both of you to talk about a little bit, but um, Hale Parker has a decrepit nature center, and so uh, we're talking about how we can potentially replace that. Um, we do uh, things like cleanups. There's too much garbage along the sides of the road, so we do periodic cleanups. Uh, and we do, uh, we've done some really, I think, some very serious attempts to uh, positively impact the uh, the ecology, for example, uh, dealing with uh, invasive plants. Uh, the, the ponds, and particularly Field Pond and Stearns Pond, probably have a lot of invasive plant activity, or have had, um, milfoil being the biggest one. Uh, the Friends made every attempt we could to uh, remove those invasive plants by uh, non-chemical uh, means. Um, and we did uh, hand picking. We, uh, we we really tried to see how far we could get with that, uh, and we realized it's very very uh, time consuming and difficult. But we we made we thought a very good impact on that. We were not able to uh, hold off the uh, DCR from uh, using an herbicide in field pond. Uh, they've done it twice now in the last five years. Uh, we, as a French group, are very much against that. So we don't always agree with DCR. Uh, and we 
we made that very clear to them. We worked with the conservation commissions in the towns. We uh, really tried to stop uh, what we thought was a very negative uh, event. And we didn't. Um, but we're still working on it. So one of the things that uh, is happening now with Harold Parker is uh, the resource management plan, which is done every 10 years, is due to be done, I think, next year. Ironically, the plan, the RMP, the resource management plan for 10 years ago, uh, said very specifically that it did not support using herbicides to uh, uh, treat these invasive plants. One reason is they grow back. They don't work. Uh, they work for a year and then the stuff grows back. And so in the resource management plan 10 years ago, DCR acknowledged that, but in spite of that, there was, there was some uh, neighbor uh, effort and, and I think in the long run it was the fastest, cheapest way to do it. So that's an example where, you know, quite frankly, we, we failed to uh, do what we wanted to do, which was to stop uh, what we thought was a really bad practice. But we're going to keep keep working on that. So um, that those are just samplings of things that uh, uh, the friends do. Some we've been very successful with, and uh, some we we have to do do a lot more work. So what do you think of kayaks? Do they have allow allow motorboats? <coughs> Well, it, it actually can come to, from any boat. Right, so maybe from kayaks and canoes and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What so about just some signage that advises, you know, like they have at most of the ponds around here that allow motorboats, they have signs clean the boat off. Yeah. Septic fields. Like, Septic fields. Yeah, there, there, there are a lot of factors. Pond. So there, at Field Pond, there are uh, residences that, that uh, border the pond. So there, there are multiple causes for it. Um, you know, most, a lot of ponds uh, and lakes, uh, Squam Lake in, in New Hampshire is really notable for the way they've attacked the, uh, the invasive plant issue. They, um, they have a big device that's called a suction harvester and they vacuum the uh, invasives right off the, uh, the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, what, what we learned as we researched is Massachusetts um, is, I would say, dramatically behind. Uh, so it, it's very common in Massachusetts for herbicides. Uh, there's a, a, another pond in uh, Andover, a foster pond that uh, nukes, nukes, that's, that's the incorrect term, but uh, uses herbicides. and. They, they do clean the pond up. Um, what we noticed was that when the uh, herbicide went in, the, uh, the, you didn't see frogs, turtles, you didn't hear birds. It took about a year for that to all come yeah, back. I thought they claim that it doesn't. Oh, that, well, sure they do. And, and Very targeted stuff. They said that about DDT, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. maybe it affects the, uh, the oxygen levels. The stuff is decomposing. Up a lot of oxygen, right? so yeah, it may not be the chemical directly that's doing it. But. Yeah, there, there are uh, there are a lot of studies. There are some concerns, and we have uh, friends and members who live near uh, Field Pond who worry about their well water. Mm -hmm. So this is one of these things. It, it's it's a kind of a gray area, but it, it's you don't want to be gray about stuff like this. That's so. Um, Anyway, I, I, my, my point, I, I'm kind of obsessing on that, but uh, the, the real point is we try to get this balance between conservation and, and recreation. Um, I, and let me just uh, move off that for a little bit. And I am not an expert on any of this. We, have, um, we do have two DCR folks here who probably know a lot more about this than I do. Do, do you want to introduce yourselves? No? Sure. My, my name is Barbara Bowles. I'm the Regional Interpretive Coordinator for the North Region. 
in which Harold Parker is contained. So my region goes from like Salisbury Beach on the north down to Walden Pond and includes the Middlesex Fells and Breakheart and, mm -hmm. and many of the big beaches, including Revere Beach, Constitution mm -hmm. Beach, Winthrop Shores, um, and that. And But Harold Parker is very close to my heart because I started working at Harold Parker in 1998. And uh, I was the park interpreter there for three seasons. So, um, yeah, I just, I love Harold Parker. And I've been lost in Harold Parker many times. Because <laughs> I was hiking there before they had any kind of trail markings at all. And that's how you learn your way around. That's right, huh? I mean, I lived out west for a long time, and I hiked in a lot of wilderness areas. So it's like, oh, this is the little park. I'll just walk until I find my way out, you know? So, but it's, it's between the gun it, range and Route 125. You can right, right, right. You can hear. Yourself. You can orient yourself. Yeah, triangulation. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm, I'll stand up because I'm so short. <laughs> um, this is day three of my brand new job as park interpreter. So, I am one of the um, successors of Barbara being Harold Parker Park interpreter. Um, so I'll be sitting down with Barbara over the next couple of days and weeks, orienting and also figuring out what our 2022 schedule will be like for all the activities we'll be doing. So looking very much forward to that. Um, I have one foot in the Friends of Harold Parker camp because I am a member and have been a member for about 10 years now. And so I took off my Friends of Harold Parker cap earlier, put it in my car and put my DCR cap on today for my other foot now in DCR. I've wanted to be a, a park ranger since I was about four years old, so I don't have my ranger hat yet. I'm just wearing the little cap, but hopefully in a few days I'll actually have a ranger hat and so I'll be able to be rubbed elbows with Smokey the Bear. <laughs> so I'm. this is a dream come true job for me. So I've lived in North Reading for 30 years. I've biked and hiked in Harold Parker for 30 <coughs> years. It's near and dear to my heart as well as a resident of North Reading. Um, I'm just thrilled to be the new park interpreter. And I've already, in three days, the Nature Center is now outside because the inside is too messy to look at yet. I'm in the middle of cleaning it all up, but now I have signs on the outside, so at least there's a little presence of Nature Center. The sea is gone, so it's really the Nature Enter right now. <laughs> but, uh, so please come by the campground and um, look me up. Great. Thanks. So I'm. I'm this is not anywhere near my area of expertise, but I think there are a couple things that I'll, I'll key in on. Uh, you know, fires, I think we've all heard how Native Americans typically use fire to uh, kind of control plant and plant life in, in, with very positive outcomes. That doesn't happen anymore here or out west, uh, as we know all too well. Um, <laughs> There, there have been fires in Harold Parker. There have been small ones, but there hasn't been any control fire. Uh, that, uh, there was one, I don't know, five years ago or so, just small. Beaver, there are all sorts of beavers. Uh, and this is, uh, this is one of these areas where conservation, recreation, <laughs> boom. Um, so, Actually, I've got. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about beavers, um, and then we already talked about how there has there was kind of a, uh, a pretty significant deforestation, and some, particularly with the CCC, reforestation. Now, uh, I think it's more just random, right? It's it is what it is. There's no. It's regrowth. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. But wasn't there some thinnings on about? about 10 years ago um, in the northern yeah, section? Yeah, yeah, there have been, and I don't know if that's still going on, but there were, uh, for a few years, there were periodic uh, sections being thinned out. Mm -hmm. yeah. What, uh, North Reading has some unique spots, and I, I don't know, I didn't know that till I, uh, really uh, inherited some of these slides. So uh, it, this is right off of uh, Marblehead, yeah. mm -hmm. where you enter. And so I, now that I 
specialized rock or special uh, rock out outcrops. So don't know, but that hill it, it says at the end of Bradford Pond. That's Osgood Hill. That's the yeah. Nova. Right. Old Reading line is a town. Right. There's a stone big, mark. Yeah, you big have to get on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that back to the Osgood family and all that. Yeah. And, uh, Osgood, that's Osgood. Yeah, that goes back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. So, I mean, I got these old deeds, you know, back in yeah. you know, the 1700s early. Sometimes we need ones from like 20 years ago because they're... <laughs> well, the state owns it all now, so... Well, like, yeah, you know, yeah. That was another uh, <laughs> another thing the friends got into because there have been some uh, property questions. Uh, but fortunately yeah. resolved. What, what do you mean that they have no file of Rock out crops is holding fire. Yeah, what does that mean? Rock out crops is having fire. They can't burn. I don't know. I didn't write that slide. I, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, plead ignorance on that. That that could be a typo. I'm not sure. Um, we talked about reforestation, so I'm not going to. Uh, fauna. So this may be a statement of the obvious. I think if you've uh, been in Harold Park, you, you do see, you can see many, many uh, types of, of animals that bar, barred owl, uh, for one. I've seen a bunch of them. Um, the fish, we, we talked about uh, there has been some stocking of trout, for example, and, and bass occasionally. Barbara runs a, a fishing derby every year, which is a, usually a, a fantastic event, and uh, that's always fun to see. Um, there are some other mammals that uh, I don't know if anybody has seen a fisher. I've seen a bunch of them um, in my backyard. And Just also. go look in the dumpster behind the headquarters. <laughs> That's where I see them. <laughs> well, fisher, I, what I understand about them, they have a 30 mile radius that they work. And uh, But if they have a dumpster, they don't have to go too far. So, um, but, but that, my house is within that radius. So we'll, we're going to get your, your fisher. They fish, they're amazing creatures face up, face close up, because their face really does look like a little bear or something. What about the coyotes now? Yeah, I mean, what, you know, now I'm going pure opinion. There, there, there are too many deer in the Northeast or in North America. There aren't predators um, or, you know, there are, uh, there's limited uh, hunting, and it, deer are kind of overrunning uh, a lot of things. Um, so you see a ton of deer, for sure, in, in Harold Park. And of course, that is all part of the whole tick cycle. Um, that's the image of a great blue heron behind there. There are many places, all these ponds and swamps where um, you see the, the blue heron. Uh, this is, I don't know if anybody's been out in the fall, but uh, there, that's where the pheasants, there's a, a few day cycle where there are pheasants all running around. And, and they're not, because <laughs> that's a, a prime hunting. So yeah, beavers. Um, oh yeah. You've all seen a picture of a beaver. So this is a picture from about a month ago of uh, the Skug River from between the campground and Field Pond. This is about a 20-foot section of what used to be a pretty lousy bridge, but now it's not even that. So this 20-foot section used to span the Skug River, and then there was another section of uh, of kind of bog bridge because it was muddy on either side. But the skug used to be about 20 feet wide. This, there's been a lot of beaver activity here. This is now 150 feet wide. The trail is inaccessible. Uh, it's three and a half feet deep right here. 
I know because I, I waded in there. <laughs> um, so this is an example of something that were the Friends, uh, another group, uh, NEMBA, which is New England Mountain Bike Association, are partnering with DCR. Um, we're, what we, we can't uh, disrupt the beaver. Uh, we have tried things like uh, beaver deceivers with mixed results. Beaver deceiver is the you know, simplest uh, explanation. It's a pipe that runs through the dam and it, it, a, lot, it a, 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 a pond leveler is another name for it. So it allows the water to go down and you, you trick the beaver. Beavers, will, anytime they hear running water, they'll basically it. dam it up. And if you clear a dam, which is illegal, Within 24 hours, they'll they'll be they'll it'll be back. So uh, so you, you, legally you can't do it, and it doesn't it isn't worth doing anyway. Um, what we're talking about on this joint project is building because this, as I said, this is now 150 feet, and this on either side is kind of low. We're talking about building a 200 foot boardwalk so that we can reestablish that connection. We're going to make it uh, wide enough, wheelchair accessible. So this uh, trail is not really handicap accessible now, but that's the ultimate goal, is to reestablish a connection between the campground and Field Pond and, and build a uh, handicap accessible trail. So this is a project we're uh, going through approval right now. Does this not dry up in the off season anymore? No, it it used to before the right. beavers. Yeah. yeah. The last two years, this has been underwater, and and the dam is not that big yet. So I, I that's the other reason we want to make a 200 foot because they can still do some building there. And now, they have babies. They have babies. Yeah. <laughs> The other side of it, though, is that what the beavers do with this cycle is really, really positive. The, the, the cycle of creating a beaver pond, which uh, when the dam breaks, when they move away, the, the turns into a beaver meadow. It's very fertile. It's really good for the ecology. It's, you know, bad, if you want to call it bad, for uh, hikers, bikers, whatever. So that's why we... Um, so we, we've got to basically figure out how to live with these beavers. And for for about ten years, we, we need a bridge. And ten years from now, that bridge may be uh, over a, a meadow. But then it'll be a, a nice bridge over hopefully a pretty meadow. So anyway, that's that's another kind of project that we're doing. Um, again, I don't know much about all this stuff, but these are. Uh, for, uh, in particular, uh, endangered or rare species. So they're protected, and uh, the good news is they have a home in the HP. So, so I think uh, maybe this all is just kind of goes without saying. You can do a lot of different things at, at Harold Parker, and uh, uh, this is just some of them. Swimming. Um, the swimming pond is Berry Pond. This, this I didn't update this slide. Um, there are no lifeguards there. The, the pond is open, so you swim at your own risk. And that's actually, I think, been a pretty good solution. Finding lifeguards was becoming a an inhibitor to opening the pond. So now swimming at your own risk. That's one place, uh, Berry Pond, uh, Kettle Pond, and that's one place where a beaver deceiver has been put in to uh, lower the pond so that the beach is restored. The beach got kind of overrun, uh, or the water level is too high. Uh, and camping, um, you know, I. I've mentioned the campground a few times, but it's 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 a really big, large campground. It's open uh, and it's already um, very active. 
so the first weekend it was almost full, is what I understand. So mm -hmm. that that's uh, one of the things that, that resources that's used the most. Yeah, um, really, do a lot of tree <coughs> That's just the MH trees. I mean, they they have stacked up all over the place, and that looked like they were a lumber operation. Mm -hmm. Were they selling they it? They cut 197 trees in the campground. Were they selling it? No, no. They were their oaks that are diseased. Oh, so it was just That's they were just taking damage. Though, some of those. Right. Those, 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 those pretty good it was stuff. it was a safety issue. They there was you know a couple on every site, and yeah, that looked, you know, wow. yeah. So they didn't do anything with it, I mean, a lot of wood. Yeah, I hope they will. But that, that looked noble to me. That's one of the things that our eastern forces, forests are facing is damage from insects and oh, yeah. other diseases. I mean, we have multiple species of mostly insects and diseases well, that are really attacking our Yeah, the bully yeah. 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 is wiping them on top. Right? Yeah. Emerald yeah. yeah, ash borer and that, you know. Yeah, we, when we were out at the, uh, that beaver underwater bridge uh, just two days ago, or three days ago, we saw it, there's one uh, American chestnut, but it's, it's on its way out. Oh, is that? That one's flooded too, or it's not flooded. It's oh, just okay. it's, yeah. it's 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 dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I see them at the uh, there's some in yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But they don't get very big. No. Ash too. There's tons of ash around when I was a kid. I never see an ash tree anymore. I don't even know what happened to them. Yeah. Well, as you said, the blights. Uh, <clears throat> Cedars are going because of the deer. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, anyway, I feel like I could keep talking, uh, but I I covered uh, a little history and uh, and I got my plug in for the friends of Harold Parker. I hope. Uh, any any questions? Yeah. I've always been intrigued by the name of Camp Lorraine. Is does anyone know any of the origin of? How Camp Lorraine got its name. I'm wondering that did that happen around the time of World War One or something? I don't know. And it I, was somebody's daughter, and I can't oh. remember whose oh. daughter it was. They named it after somebody's daughter. I I, I was thinking about I should check that out, but I don't. But <laughs> and there was we're, we're some with connection that. with the CCC. <laughs> Oh. It was like oh, the commanding officer's daughter's oh. name. And yes, now, now, following the uh, disbandment of uh, of the um, of the CCC in, in '41, wasn't wasn't some of the barracks and other installations used uh, for a short time for uh, training troops in World War uh, Two? If you look State at the police barracks over on you know, yeah. Mill yeah. Street there, the yeah. old, what they call it, Harold Pocono, that was Mill Street originally. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the Stadies were down there before they built that other one that's yeah. on the corner. But the, yeah. um, the I remember that, um, the, I believe there were some soldiers uh, yeah. stationed there briefly. Yeah, for, I think you're right. Uh, yeah. Because my, my, my parents who, uh, I live on Havel Street, and uh, my parents, who purchased their house in 1940, uh, recounted an incident of a uh, of a uh, of a of a drunken um, a serviceman pounding on their door uh, in, in the middle of the night because he was stumbling his way back to uh, the camp and wanted a match to light his cigarette. <laughs> so I think my father. Toss out the upstairs window a book of matches or something, <laughs> which he seemed to have trouble using. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, funny. That, yeah. that's great. If you look at the, the 1944 map, it shows military police camp where the um, campground headquarters are now. Oh right. Yeah. Oh, I see. For yes, military yeah. police. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think the, the I think the state police have been there for some. Mm -hmm. uh, they are at the corner there uh, for some time. Mm -hmm. At least the twenties. At least yeah, yes, you know, because that that the the uh, the architecture of the building is I think from a no, it, from a state uh, the state police barracks were all built of similar design there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
House was called a post house. And there was a stopover for stages. Uh, they dressed the horses, and supposedly the upstairs uh, back room was a dance hall. So was there another one um, in the writing right there? Could be. Yeah, I don't know. That, that was in Salem Street. Yeah, yeah kind of. So you said that the Osgood farm was 500 acres, yeah. and that it went from around Berry Farm to the North Reading Corner? No, no um, I'm not sure how, well, it, the Osgood Hill, I think, was part of it, so it, it was south. Don't believe it. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the exact um, footprint was. Yeah, well, it, it, see, it was on the side that it was down to the North Reading border, but right. if the park is... 3,000 acres and barely pond to the North Reading border. It seems to be a significant chunk of the park. How can the park be? Is the 3,000 acres including the nine contiguous bits? Yeah, the three, the 3,200 it includes all that. But the, the, you know, the, the way I always think about Harold Parker is you've got the west side, west of mm -hmm. uh, Jenkins Road, which is south of uh, Salem Street. Um, that's, you know, maybe a quarter of the overall footprint. That's a lot of where the uh, Osgood Farm was. Mm -hmm. The um, then you've got the east, the southeast section, and then the north. So south of uh, Middleton Road, and then on the east side, and then the north north. Those are both big sections. So yeah. and then there's the stuff across the street. Yeah, and, 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 and 100 and, acres, and, and, you know, south of Marblehead Marble Street. Marblehead, that's right. So it, it just kind of sprawls yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Um, also, I think that what you call the 100 acres is, mm -hmm. um, is on the other side of Marblehead Street from Bradford Pond, mm -hmm. but very close to that. Very few people know about it, I think. Mm -hmm. It's kind of bounded by Marblehead Street, um, Foley Drive, that whole area. Mm -hmm. And there's actually an old... A former Girl Scout camp yeah. that used to be there. There's a memorial there. Too. Yeah, there's yeah. like oh, an old flagpole, yeah. and yeah. Kylie yeah. and I, when we were hiking awesome. there one day, ran mm -hmm. into a gentleman that showed us where this old Girl Scout camp was. There's remnants yeah. of some of the buildings. I'd love to learn more of the history of that because yeah. it's really a part of Harold Parker. I think most of the big development that went in probably that all land was all bought up and turned into housing development there. Right. But That's there's still remnants. A, a little island. Yeah, there's still yeah. some yeah. remnants on that side. Yeah. And there's lots of the um, the red pine there mm -hmm. too that were planted. Uh, the, the, uh, Jenkins, uh, the Jenkins farm you were showing earlier that had the Abolition Association. Now that is the, the Mortimer Pettigrew farm, yeah. isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, and they were, and the Mortimer Pettigrew farm were a, uh, a two families that, that uh, lived in the huge house together and they and I guess from the 1930s up until almost to the 1960s I had a major mink farm right. and, they, uh, and they and they raised mink and of course you when the wind was right you knew that they when was that and then probably, probably maybe early 70s, maybe at the latest. Time. Yeah, that, that yeah. they... Yeah. Well, they, they're used to read. Yeah, because they oh. say they, they eventually <laughs> held it out. They, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, they, uh, oh, they closed them, but, but they, yeah. all, the, uh, all the time that my, my, when my parents were yeah. alive, it was, uh, yeah. it was a, it was a yeah. fairly big... And that was also on Marblehead Street. Mm -hmm. yeah. The you know, Stanley family had a big, big yeah. farm. Yeah. 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 That's, that's yeah. cool. There's another kind of uh, just random factoid. Uh, in the 50s, the state wanted to make Carol Parker the home of a uh, state prison. Oh, oh, oh my! Oh. I'm quite sure Randolph was well, there. That was no way. <laughs> <laughs> four towns border Harold Parker, four right. towns 
got together and, and, uh, and uh, squashed that. Oh, that's right. And those things. Yeah. There was a lot of discussion in the Lawrence Daily Eagle about that at the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah that I was. Remember that was, my parents was, talking about yeah. a talking big about that. Yeah. The, there is a um, the uh, still in North Reading the the uh, the large stone house on the left hand side uh, just uh, this side of the end of the line yeah. uh, the, uh, the Flint House. Uh, it's uh, lintels and um, door jams are, are. It's a it's a field stone house, but all the lintels and door jams are from the quarry. Oh. Uh, yeah. And uh, you can see they work. And the and as you climb as you climb up. Uh, uh, just before you get to um, uh, turn down Marble Hit Street, on your right-hand side there is a um, a rough-cut gate post, which also still stands there uh, near the edge of uh, driveway, right by the street, which is also from that quarry mm -hmm. of all that material. Mm -hmm. I actually rescued a blue soapstone sink from one of our other parks, they were going to toss it out. Oh, and I, yeah, it's it's like, like, yeah. He's yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're so you have it everywhere, not even near the mill. Right. All over the place. Right. Yeah. And it's sitting. Coming down Jenkins Road, somebody's cleared out on the right, you probably know what I'm talking about. It looks like they're going to put something in right after. Oh, yeah. Watermark yeah. right on the right there, yeah. but just look up there's a hill yeah. right there, and you can tell it's all been yeah. 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 Right. Quarried a little bit, but right, you just right, left right. them all there. Yeah. And you must know yeah. there's another road as you come north. The old there was a road that went to the right and came out by Berry Pond, way down below, and came out on well Middleton Road now. Right. But uh, yeah, that that's on all the old. There's an 1830 map that's even better than that 1855 map too for Andover. There's quarrying mm -hmm. evidence yeah. all throughout the forest. I mean, if you yeah. walk stone stone fences and. And yeah. drill marks and well, everything you the, can yeah. see. The bridge around. they just replaced here in North Reading at the Ipswich <laughs> River here, that was done with that quarry stone oh, in okay. 1912. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But anyway, that blue soapstone sink is sitting right in front of the little dilapidated nature center. Oh, okay. we don't <laughs> oh my goodness, that's yeah, what that is? That's, that's a blue soapstone soap sink. Huh. And I now I know. To I let it go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other, the other it's just thing. just kind of sitting oh there. By the, other, the other big thing is the soapstone is they used it uh, down in Boston, in Summer Street. So yeah. a lot of the, the, the facades, go, yeah. 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 The, uh, that, that, uh, Soap some quarry went bankrupt. They had all sorts of financial issues, so that, that's yeah. The, part guy, of the guy, yes. There was a crook involved. Fellow named Flannery stole it. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, he, right. He took off <laughs> yeah. for the colonies or something. Yeah. That that whole blue soapstone quarry, I I have been back there with the geologist years and years ago, and of course I I don't you know know a lot about that, but she found what she calls the contact point between the soapstone and the granite. Oh. And it's actually exposed. Oh. And she was like freaking out and going, oh my God, look, weekends. I was like, yay. <laughs> I didn't even know, but you can scratch soapstone with even a stick. Right. Probably you know about this or a key or something, but granite you cannot. Oh, and okay. so oh. there's this, you know, contact point and if you look at a geology map of Massachusetts, there is this extrusion just in that area. Huh. So it's, a, it's unique to yeah, this yeah. area. Now, up in Vermont and all of that, there are a lot of, you know, blue soapstone, and there are people who quarry it still and work it and make things mm -hmm. from the blue soapstone. But mm -hmm. that is, has always been like a dream of mine that we could sort of clear it out and interpret that blue soapstone quarry just, you know, I mean, there's actually parking there. We could mm -hmm. move the stones and, you know, but maybe it's something we don't want to point out, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. so many of the, of the stones there are so flat, you can tell that they were cut with a blade. Mm -hmm. um, and especially over on the other side of the Skug River, there are pieces that look like they were cut like into slabs for Yeah, when you could they took off all the money, they everything just swapped. Right, it just fell yeah. apart. But yeah. they, they did go back, like I said, it was almost nineteen twelve, they did they got enough to do the bridge there. You know. Right. I was surprised, but that makes sense, you know. Right. It was only quarried for about fifteen years or something, yeah. Flannery and 
I uh, think they came, Jenkins. Yeah, people came and did stuff with their own. Right. Jenkins, yeah. you already right, put a regular mill in there. Yeah. You know, right. yeah. a couple of mills. All yeah. kinds of mills on the Skog River. Yeah, they're, 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 yeah, once again, the Skog, there were 1.3 sawmills going. I'm putting all sorts of pieces of puzzle together because I bought my house on Marblehead Street in 1992, so I've been there almost 30 years. The woman living next to me, um, his name was Lorraine, and she all she had they had old cages where we believe they raised mix. So it's like all these pieces are like, oh my goodness. Well, is, that, is, that the, is that the Lorraine? So. The, who, maybe that's Lorraine from the yeah. campground. Who knows? We'll go with it. <laughs> we can start a story anyway. Yeah, right. yeah. That's how history gets written. Right. Urban legends, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So the slide said that one of the one of the CCC camps was near Bradford Pond. Is that just a typo or is yeah. was there a okay. It was? <laughs> I noticed that. Yeah. yeah. Typo. I, it it yeah, well, you mean because there wasn't a bit Bradford Pond? Because it's near bracket pond. Oh, oh bracket. bracket. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That, that makes, makes more sense. sense. Yeah. 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 I was I was kind of scratching my head a little bit too. So. Oh. I gotta. You notice we get below the where the mill was, the Soapstone Mill, that's turned into Skog River becomes a lake there because, uh, well, I was told by one of the Eisenhowers and somebody from Andover that when they put in 125, they dug all that out. This 125 was put in. The original one from 20, 28 up to what Merrimack is now was put in because the, the Phillips didn't want the trucks driving from Boston through, so it was, became the Andover Bypass, you know. Huh. And uh, that's where they dug that all out, supposedly, because, you know, obviously you can see parts of 125 are raised up, and also for that matter, the North Reading Little League field was dug out for that, too. Hmm. You know, if you know what that is, you know, yeah. done off of Gould Road, sure. right on the Central yeah. Street line. Right. Yeah. You know, in fact, that's the other Jenkins house right there. Yeah. You know, yeah. they had an older house, so I won't go into the history of that. But, yeah. but um, the old Fry Farm, that was. But anyway, yeah, I get all those deeds. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who bought it on Osgood Farm, you know, because that was the biggie over there. Right. He was the only one that had the 400, 500 in one piece. You know, most of the Andover people, like, like my family had 300 on where Holt Hill is, Ward Reservation, and the other part was over where Hidden Road and Holt Road are in Andover. Mm -hmm. So he had 600 or so himself, but it was sep they slightly separated, you know. Yeah. Well, that's good. So the, the rumor was he had a little more pull over well, from England, supposedly. <laughs> well, yeah. The and they went back to Salem, too, you know. They got yeah. The Osgoods. Uh, I've read two two different things. One was that they were granted the original acreage from uh, the town, and the other from the king. So, I think it was a little little bit of each. Uh, yeah. Well, I think the town would have represented the king, but the they, other, they could have had some. The other little weird thing is Asleep's farm there. The hill is and everything. Yeah. That 140 acres, which yeah. they never lived on it, you know. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah, that's that's the hill that. Because uh, people they would talk talk in Andover, because I, I, you know. Yeah. But, even though we're not threading, most people know what the heck I'm talking about. So, you know. <laughs> well, anyway, okay. Oh, we didn't. We came late. Did you talk about the glacier period? A little bit. Yes. Can you say it quick so we know? Uh, well, there were two two miles of uh, ice, ice where we're standing now, and yeah. Oh, uh, Andy, pull up the slide. Yeah. Okay. So two miles of ice over a lot of the uh, north and northeast, eastern uh, U.S. twenty thousand to. 50,000 years ago. 20,000 is when it started to recede. Um, and when it, when it retreated, uh, this, this, we talked a lot, this keeps coming up, this glacial erratic. I got to tell a side story here because this 
ticked me off so much. <laughs> in 2016, somebody spray painted Trump on, on the back. Oh, the next one, right? What? No, just Trump. Oh. Uh, you, you can call that an expletive, but okay. no, no politics. Just it was. Uh, Thank you. It was a bad move. Yep. Um, Thank you. Is it still there, or is it gone? No, I, I rubbed it off. Oh, oh nice. Why you should keep going? Right. Thanks, Nate. So, three right. good features uh, were, that were left were these massive erratics, great big stones, and uh, kettle ponds. There, there are two kettle ponds in Harold Parker. Berry Pond, which is a swimming area. Bear Pond. Bear Pond is hard to distinguish as a kettle pond yeah. because uh, of all the changes and... Uh, uh, I'm old enough to remember when it was just the little the stone walls yeah. and everything there. You know, yeah. was, yeah. That was no man's land. That was split up between my family and the Russells. Yeah, <laughs> but that, yeah. that was with some of the uh, water changes. Uh, all this it just basically turned it all into swamp. So it, it, what used to be a distinct kettle pond is now just looks like a swamp. Yeah. And then drumlins are the hills, and they're, they're drumlins all over. Uh, but there's a big one in Harold Parker um, in the northeast section that's not contiguous with the rest of the, the park. There's a fantastic LIDAR map of Massachusetts that I have run across recently. And when you zoom way out, you can see, actually see the directional hmm. movement yeah. of the glaciers by how the drumlins are lined up, mostly like in Essex County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure it would yeah. show. Essex is unbelievable. Yeah. Because we think we've got a lot, but they, <laughs> there's just so much granite and ledge and everything right. that was left. So anyway, that that's kind of the, the short version. And how about the Indians? Were, were they up yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. Which? Agawam. Uh, well, that's the next slide. Okay. We <laughs> 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 you. Yeah, you. You don't all have to stay. Um, I don't think there's a ton known about it. As I said, I wouldn't swear that that's an accurate representation. But um, there were Native Americans. There used to be a museum for the Indians that was in Phillips, but I don't know how dated it is, you know. Huh. Yeah. When we were kids, there was one yeah. right on 28, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 right in the academy, yeah. 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 They, they have been uh, findings yeah. in Harold Park. Yeah. The yeah. other thing, though, I, been by what I read was a lot of, uh, there were some findings, but all these Jenkins and Osgood farmers or whoever, a lot of stuff they found just, uh, so, there, there still may be stuff there, but it's not as rich a uh, finding area. There's some other sections I know in Andover, Indian Ridge, <laughs> is a uh, section where they're just found. And it's also a place with a lot of glacial activity, eskers, and they found incredible uh, Amounts of uh, mm -hmm. artifacts there. So is that just the Skug River going through? Yeah, the Skug. Uh, everything with the uh, the the Agawams and then all of the early settlers. It was all centered around the Skugs. All the um, yeah. farms, all the houses, all the um, uh, mills, and everything else. Really, the Skug is kind of the central feature. And yeah. today, it's a central feature. It starts on the okay. side of Boston Hill. Yep. And uh, a little bit off a of whole till, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's, today, it's the center of all the beaver activity. <laughs> oh, yeah, especially <laughs> the Great Meadow. Yes. Yeah. Are, are drumlins similar to like moraines, which is the end of a glacier when it receives? Moraines would be Cape Cod. Okay. That's where it stopped. That's okay, why. So I think Long Island's okay. another one. They're very, you right. know, so they go like this. So the drumlins yeah. are the same as like the moraines, the very end of the glacier. Yeah, the glacier, glacier will stop for a thousand years and how, drop stuff, you know. How were the drumlins formed? As the ice retreated, and they yeah. just were dragging yeah. stuff okay. behind them, and they. Okay. Uh, they and I, the hills. Well, Boston Hills are drumlin. Right. So yeah. it's Holt Hill. And, right. and those yeah. are the largest. Yeah. Right. The largest in Essex County. Yeah. Highest, anyways. Okay. Highest, yeah. yeah. Okay. I live in New Hampshire now, so it's funny. Yeah. I go up here, but this is all, you know, you really see 
Yeah. One is the yeah, erratics, you've got to go north, and you see, you know, I've seen some of them three times the size of that, but, but down here, that's yeah. huge. You know? Yeah, it is. You know, but you're so right, there are big ones. Yeah. Um, there's a uh, site, and I don't have it at the tip of my hat, but, or, oh, yeah. Yeah. but there, there is a site of uh, glacial activity <laughs> in Harold Parker. And it, that's where I got one of those maps. Or, and it, it had a lot more technical information, which I did not fully master, so I didn't. Oh, wow. <laughs> who, 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 who did that? Uh, I could find it. Yeah, I, I, would, I would really like to see it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, right. I, 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 I can send you yeah, one. Yeah. 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 Y